Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. They actually do less harm to the native Texas ecosystems than these crazy ants do. We watch the cattle, we watch the goats, we look for the deer. It's hard to pick one thing because I love it all. If you can't remember having seen a bird, it's a new bird for you. So the older you get, the easier it is to get new birds. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. sweeping up dead ants every day, millions of ants inside their house, ants getting into the electrical equipment, and then the electric circuit shorts out. Just much, much worse. The script is familiar. An exotic ant invades, wreaking havoc. But these are not fire ants, and this is not a horror film. There is no word to describe them. Yet like the movies, native species battle for survival. There is public alarm. Stay in your home. And scientists race to combat the menace. This is one crazy ant. I tell you, gentlemen, science has agreed. The tawny crazy ant, native to South America, was first documented near Houston and in Florida in the early 2000s. Since then, it has invaded around the Gulf Coast. They're found in a variety of different habitats, urban, uh, suburban, and then also in natural environments. In Texas, we know that when you get an invasion of crazy ants, you lose lots and lots of insects, and you also lose all the ants, except for a few small species. Researchers, like Ed Lebrun, are concerned by the impacts of crazy ants on natural systems, even in the suburbs. Yeah, they are very active today. They cause a lot of damage to the native ecosystems by greatly reducing abundance and diversity of other insects in the system. And some natural places are especially fragile. This many ants in any environment will have negative consequences, typically. But there's a lot of endangered species in these caves, right, Todd? Yeah. At the entrance of a protected cave on the outskirts of Austin, LeBron and natural resource specialist Todd Bayliss know swarms of crazy ants on the surface are bad news for rare cave bugs below. We got a call from Texas Cave Management Association to tell us that there was a major infestation of ants that they'd never seen before in their cave. And sure enough, found this tawny crazy ant in huge numbers inside the cave itself. That was a concern to us since this is one of the caves we hope to protect for some species of concern. We knew that they had the potential of being found in other endangered species caves nearby. Onward and inward. My name is Travis Clark. I'm a natural resources specialist for Travis County at the Balcones Canyonlands Preserve. The BCP was created to provide protections for eight endangered species. Six of those are karst invertebrates. We're at a cave in South Austin that's been impacted by tawny crazy ants. And the reason we're entering today is to do one of our quarterly karst faunal surveys to assess impacts by tawny crazy ants. There he is, right there. Right there. This is one of the species of concern that we're trying to protect. It's the species name's Rudini austinica. These species are essentially canaries in a coal mine. And so they're going to be indicative of cave health. And these cave systems are important because they're recharge features. People benefit through drinking water, through recreation, where this comes out in springs. Sicarina bandita. And that was two? One. OK. So essentially, what we're charged with is providing all the safeguards we can for these caves. The underground ecosystem is very unique, not just in North America, but all over the world. Knowing we had a problem, we looked for experts in the ant community that could possibly help us out. And we found Ed LeBron over at UT's Brackenridge Field Lab. This is the Invasive Species Research Group at the University of Texas at Austin. And we are uh, working on a lot of invasive species problems in the state of Texas. Most people in Texas, when you're talking about invasive ants, are thinking about red imported fire ants. They actually do less harm to the native Texas ecosystems than these crazy ants do. Crazy ants, so named for their erratic movements, 
eat or outcompete most of the spiders and insects around them, including the formidable fire ant. Fire ants are very tough. They have this extremely toxic venom. She actually goes up and literally takes the venom droplet off the end of the fire ant stinger. And crazy ants, they go, they fight, they get hit with fire ant venom, they just keep fighting, they keep charging in, and they should all be dying. And so then here's the crazy ant detoxing from the venom. People, when you tell them they displace fire ants, like, yay. But the net effect is very negative. Insects are the base of the terrestrial food web. So if you knock out the base of the food web, those impacts then spread throughout the rest of the system. Like birds and reptiles that feed directly on the insects, which plants proliferate and which plants don't. So you can really change the whole system by altering the arthropod community. Here's a trap. Such threats have biologists searching for ways to control crazy ants. Texas Parks and Wildlife contributed funding to an early investigation of boric acid right. bait stations in the field. Unfortunately, it's not very promising. We discovered that although the crazy ants loved the bait, brought the poison back to their nests, that it just didn't reduce the densities of the ants that we were hoping for. In the lab, there is now hope for a natural enemy that some crazy ants already carry. These are uninfected ants, so these were our control ants in that experiment. The microsporidian that we're working on is showing quite a bit of promise. A fungal parasite specific to these ants could help keep them in check. The development of larvae to workers is greatly reduced by infection, and the lifespan of workers is reduced by about a quarter. There's these phytoles and solenopsis, diploropterums, that are very tiny. And most of your ant diversity is down at this kind of size. Tiny crazy ants are just a very small component of the overall ant assemblage down in Argentina. The world of ants, Leaf -cutting ants is complex. We have here in Texas as well, we've added Texana. So further studies of ant interactions, where crazy ants are native, and where they are not, may provide more ways to minimize their impacts. The subterranean nest where the beast spawns its terrible progeny. Meanwhile, we should remember that the very best solution to invasive species problems is to avoid creating them in the first place. Crazy ant queens don't fly. What that means is that they don't have a way to infest new areas except for people moving them. And that's unfortunately what's happening all over the state. So people move them when they take a potted plant somewhere that has ants in it. When you go to a, a garden store to buy something, it's important to look for ants. I mean, you don't have to be a, an ant biologist, just look for ants, and if they're covered in ants, don't buy it. Recreational vehicles are a problem as well. Being sure that there aren't any ants in your vehicle when you go visit a new place. Species invasion, it's a natural process, right? Species have been moving around the planet since there's been a planet. The problem is humans, with our commerce and everything we do, elevated the rate at which these invasions happen by many orders of magnitude. And so the natural system doesn't have time to adjust before the next invader comes. The natural systems are very resilient. If you can give them time to adjust, they will. We should be paying attention and we should be investing resources in offsetting the impact. That's why I work here. That's what we're about, is trying to change the dynamics so that we can preserve the natural systems that we all grew up with. I've come up with a new idea. And that is, if you can't remember having seen a bird, it's a new bird for you. So the older you get, the easier it is to get new birds. What's on top of the mesquite? I'm Victor Emanuel. I was born in Houston, Texas. And one thing, guys, I didn't get to mention about scope procedure. Look, to the right, a flock of birds are coming in. I got interested in birds when I was eight years old, and it's changed my life. When I was in the Cub Scouts, one of the boys said, you should join the Outdoor Nature Club. You should go to their meetings, because I can tell you're interested in nature and birds. So I went, and there I met my mentors. Frank Watson, 
Armand Iramatiki and Joe Heiser. And there I understood how important mentoring is. Those men gave me two great gifts. One, to appreciate every bird and animal that I saw, even if I'd seen it before. To savor it, to look at all the marks on it, all the detail, and to be interested in conservation. So they gave me that. Those were the gifts my mentors imparted to me. We've got some young birders in front of us who are scouting. <laughs> I've known Victor my whole life, and he's got me into birding. Interesting. He's a big reason why I like the outdoors. Yeah, here's the summer tanager here. Wonderful. He's an amazing person. I love him. Early, I was interested in being a biologist, and then I decided my interest in birds was more just looking at them and enjoying them, not studying them in the detailed way a biologist does. And then I got involved in running bird tours, and I saw that that was a way that I could have more time out in nature. I look at these catalogs and it just gives me a sense of what a I could start a company and offer in Texas, Arizona, and Mexico where I and some of my friends knew those areas. And very soon we expanded to Panama, Peru, now 150 tours all over the world. Victor, there is, a, there is an or oriole visible here. <laughs> my name is Barry Lyon. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Victor Emanuel Nature Tours. There's the Oriole on top. In 1986, Victor started a program of summertime youth camps for young people that were interested in birds and natural history. Until that time, nothing like that had ever been done before. Early in 1987, I went when I was 15 years old. Attending the youth birding camp was a transformative experience in my life. Ultimately, Victor offered me a job when I was about eight months out of college and have been with him and this company ever since. I love birds in nature. I enjoy guiding very much. But I didn't necessarily land in this line of work because this is what I had to do with my life. I chose it because of the examples that Victor set. A lot of activity coming in. Immortality is not having a monument named after you, which eventually is going to fall down. Uh, it's to offer good values and change the life of a person that then may change the life of another person that's younger, and then another person that's younger, and then another person that's younger, and that can go on for hundreds and hundreds of years. That's immortality. This is the Bigfoot Ranch. We're located almost in the center of Texas, in Mills County, in what was originally the tall grass prairie. Our efforts are to maintain and conserve as much tall grass prairie as we can. We're in the middle of nowhere, kind of, where you don't hear cars. You look around, you see all of God's wonders and the creation of nature. The Pigfoot Ranch lies within the Cross Timbers and Prairies ecoregion. This property is a great example of what that ecoregion looked like prior to 1850s, prior to European settlement. Um, the diversity that we have out here is unparalleled. So this species right here is actually a verbena species. It's really good for pollinators on the rangeland. It has a nice flower on it, and we call it Sweet William. I've never heard that before. Sweet That's William. That's a common name. That is beautiful. The original tall grass prairie in this area had live oak savannas. We have some of that. In addition, along the creeks, there are other woody species of plants. This is the main Pigfoot Spring right down here to our left. We try to maintain the vegetation along the edge of the creek so that these riparian areas will not be subject to erosion. This is a favorite spot of mine to always come down and enjoy. In the summertime, I'd rather be here than in Colorado. <laughs> the history of Bigfoot Ranch goes back to 1885. Our great-great-grandfather was the one who actually established the ranch. We would like to see our children and our grandchildren continue to own and operate the place. 
Let's work on that area right over there. We'll get those cedars right under those trees right there. Yeah, I feel like I'm pretty well up for the task. I just need a little bit more education on what I'm doing in order to do it right. Each tree takes up an awful lot of water. By keeping the number of juniper trees and mesquite trees down, we have a more healthy ecosystem. This is an area where we had a successful prescribed burn. This is burned on the tops, but you'll see the little chin oak shoots coming in at the bottom. And as the livestock and wildlife come in here, they enjoy eating those fresh shoots. So that, along with the fire, will help control the less desirable plants. We haven't always had a lot of deer out here and the deer population has grown as well as a lot of our other wildlife, which is really nice. Here on the Pigfoot, we rotate through three pastures. So it's not a difficult thing to move the cattle from one pasture to the other. They're coming, that's good. Woo! The story of the Pigfoot Ranch is not one of stark befores and afters, Woo! but rather of a long time legacy of excellence in land management, Okay. particularly with their grazing. Most of them have come in. This actually is just a little holding trap that we moved the cattle into. We can turn them out to one of two pastures from this spot. They're enjoying the fresh grass almost like candy to them. Let's go ahead and just fresh pasture and look for deer. Typically we see three or four groups of eight or 10. Oh, there goes one right there, a doe. Here we go, a doe right here. Might be able to see her right through there in the brush. Beautiful day, quality time like this is pretty special. When Tommy and I were dating, we looked for grass seeds. <laughs> we look at grasses out here. We watch the cattle. We watch the goats. We look for the deer. <laughs> it's hard to pick one thing because I love it all. I just really enjoy it being out here on the open land. Hopefully, with years to come, we can get this place looking even better than it is now. Our family motto is keep it, preserve it, and share it with future generations. <laughs> and that's what I feel good about being a part of. Hi, I'm Mike. This is Carl, and today we're going to be doing a krill survey. We're looking for anybody out fishing in a boat. Once we encounter them, then we'll stop and uh, interview them. How are you doing today? We're with Parks and Wildlife. We're just conducting an angler survey. We're with Parks and Wildlife. We're doing some angler surveys. Do you mind answering some questions? Our krills on this lake are four hours each. So you gotta be real careful when you get in this. The area. sections of the lake and the times that the krills are done are generated at random. We either go clockwise or counterclockwise that day. We'll do a flip of a coin to see which way we're gonna go and that's the way we go for the rest of the day. How long have you been fishing today? How long have you been fishing today? How long have you been fishing today? I guess I started this spot around 645. Okay. I've always been here about an hour and a half. Hour and a half? I started about six o'clock. And how much longer before you finish, do you think? How much longer? Yes, sir. Well, when it gets pretty hot, about 10 or 11 o'clock. Okay. I'm gonna try this, uh, these pillars right here and then I'm gonna quit. It helps us keep in touch with what's going on in the lake. 1069. Okay, great. This is Claire, she's our summer intern. So we're teaching her how to do all this stuff. You want to try it? No. <laughs> you go for it. <laughs> and what are you fishing for today? Crappie. Crappie. And fishing for what today? Well, mostly catfish. Catfish, OK. What are we going after? We started out with crop for crappie. Didn't do you know, it was too early. They went to catfish. Now we're going to just now start back to crappie. So just put crappie down. With all that data that we compiled, we can come up with a management plan on what to do for the lake. 
harvest regulations, size limits, getting funding for boat ramps. We get to see a lot of this lake. Everything's different every time you come out. You never know what to expect. Nothing, nothing's ever the same. Oh, I love my job. Being sitting behind a desk and looking at the computer screen all day. <laughs> Lake Brownwood State Park sits in the geographic center of Texas at the meeting place of the Texas Hill Country and the Panhandle Plains. The park was built at a turning point in our nation's history. When times were hard, Lake Brownwood State Park offered hope. Y'all see, 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 boys? Yeah. 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 <laughs> we did all the road work and all that kind of stuff all over the park here, and we're proud of it. It makes me proud to come back and see it, what we did. Yeah, I left there in 42. These hands have hauled rock and forged roads. They built a place of beauty that still charms visitors over 50 years later. These were the boys of the CCC. They served in the Civilian Conservation Corps, a work relief program established in the 1930s to combat the economic depression. Lake Brownwood State Park is a stellar example of CCC handiwork. Built from native rock, its structures recall an era of exceptional craftsmanship. It's amazing to think these things are over 70 years old and they're still standing and serving the public. They didn't have the modern power saws and everything we have nowadays. Uh, a lot of these rocks and they were used in the buildings, they were chipped and formed by hand. You don't see cracks in it. These people, when they built, they built it to last. A lot of these kids, they were the breadwinners. They were made $25 a month. They got to keep five, but 20 of it had to be sent home. A lot of these kids kept their families alive. The park was designed to showcase Lake Brownwood. The 7,300-acre lake makes a perfect spot for swimming, boating, and fishing. Or perhaps just enjoying a spectacular Texas sunset. Lake Brownwood State Park can offer its amenities to people all across the state. It's got wooded areas, uh, lakefront, it can offer a peaceful, tranquil atmosphere to anyone that wants to get away, and just a really beautiful area to be in. The CCC crews have nearly all passed on. Only a few remain to gather at the site where a group of boys became men but they've left their mark for generations to come. Visiting Texas State Parks just got easier. With our new online reservation features, you can choose a specific cabin, campsite, or shelter and reserve it for your next visit. The new reservation system makes it easier to plan group getaways. <laughs> Save the day and don't get turned away with our optional day use reservation. Good morning. And be sure to get in. Thank you. Plus, you can buy park passes and gift cards online. Yeah. Texas State Parks, getting better for you.